Welcome to the Do Good Work Podcast. Today we're talking to Zach Stevens. Zach is a designer turned brand identity expert, and he's one of the few in rare born and raised in San Diego. And he is on a mission to help SaaS founders level up their story and be more badass. Zach, thanks for being on, man. Raul, thank you for having me, my friend. It's good to see you. Good to see you too, man. I think it's good to reconnect. We've been talking quite a bit offline, in person, IRL. And, you know, it's interesting, all the things that we can talk about with design. One of the things that I found most interesting recently is kind of like your transformation. Because you started off as a designer, and then now you're really dialing in to be a brand identity. Like, focusing on what that means. And I kind of want to educate if you could start just helping me understand what that transformation is like and the thought process versus being a designer, which is a very powerful skill set and very important to focusing on an identity, on a brand identity. What's how do we confuse both? Because we can confuse both. Mm. And what's the difference? Okay. I think there's a three pronged answer here. So the first one is understanding what is a brand, right? Which is important for Anybody who's looking to make an impact and make a change in the world, whether it's through a business, through just being themselves or being a part of an organization, you're either a part of a brand or you are creating one yourself. And a brand is a gut feeling. I like to quote Marty Neumeier, somebody who is considered like the granddaddy of what branding is and what it should like getting clear definitions on it. Cause it was a really ethereal subject for a while and it still gets confused often, but a brand is the gut feeling that somebody has toward an entity, be it a person, be it a business, whatever. You don't really get a choice of whether you do or do not want to create a brand. You have one and your decision then is to choose your influence over it. Like, is it going in the direction you want it to go or is it pointing opposite? Is it scattered all over the place? That's what the brand is, the gut feeling. You get everybody to think and feel the same way toward you, then you've done a good job of building a brand and having influence over it. Which you can still be a designer for. And I kind of want to get to the the higher level thinking of what a design is. Design is art Mm -hmm. for a purpose or something that you design something for an end outcome. So I think, and I think the way that you framed is extremely important to, to be aware of. You have a brand. All of us listening right now, you have a reputation, you have a brand, and it's the gut feeling other people think about you when they think about you, either you or your business or the place that you work at. I think that's important, but you can either allow it to be as is, or you can change it. You can design it. You can, have, like you mentioned, have influence over that. Bingo. So I think that's a really good segue into the second part of that three-pronged answer, which is what is design. Right. And as you alluded to, design it, you had defined it as art with purpose. And that's good. I think that the only point of contention with that is that design does get relegated to visuals primarily, Mm -hmm. which is my trade. Like I grew up drawing, I went to school for graphic design, but design itself is like it's a macro element of like to simply craft with intention. Like I am designing Mm. my life. I am designing my day. I am designing whatever. If you are putting a plan in action and you have an outcome and goals that are looking to be established, then that is design. So graphic design, right, is like, is taking graphics, which is art, photography type letters and information and arranging them graphically so that it's easily understood and communicated. You push that further and then go to brand identity design And you add that third component of identity, which is like, you know, the framework and the makeup of a persona, like the things that allow you to easily point out who somebody is, like your identity role is comprised of a couple of things. It's your name. It's Hmm. the way that you look, your like, and then the way that you act Hmm. as well. When you do brand identity design, if you are defining what that emotion is that you want people to feel that gut feeling, you are creating the, like you're developing the persona elements of it, like the look, the feel, the way it acts, the way it talks, all the things that make it personable. Mm -hmm. And then you are crafting elements to help support that emotion and visual makeup and make it congruent across all touch points as far as business is concerned. 
Yeah, it's been, it, and I want to like uh, circle back because. I think you're right when I mentioned art, it, it does get to the visual components, but I think maybe it's more about the act of creation or bringing something to the world, which I believe we all inherently might, I guess it's a thesis that we're more fulfilled when we create and deliver something into the world. I think that's like part of our, our human nature to create. But when you talk about, because it's very surface level, how I look, how I act and behave, and it's very front facing. And it's kind of difficult to, because you can even take this a step further and be more philosophical. It's like, what is a true identity? Mm. And it's the identity that you have within yourself. If, and I know this is getting a little, we'll get a little deep there, but the identity of who you believe you to be and who you actually come out to be in reality, who, how you actually show up in life, is that congruent? And you can actually design who you want to become. And that can also kind of, that's where really it's, is it intentional? Is it integrated? Is it aligned with who you actually are? Is it aligned with who you want to become? Is it aligned with your company? Who are you growing to be and what impact or what stance or what point of view do you want the world to influence on the world? Yeah. And those are, I think. You bring up a really good point. It's that, um, I mean, you see this with people as well, right? There are people who like the way that they feel about themselves ends up floating to this two surface level things, like how they present themselves. Like, yeah. you know, this, I don't stray away from black t-shirts, right? Like it, it's pretty rare to find me outside of a black t-shirt, a pair of blue jeans and white sneakers. And the reason for that is because a core component of my belief and what makes me who I am is focus and not deliberating over things that I believe are menial or trivial. Mm -hmm. One of them being the color t-shirt that I'm going to wear that day or the color blue jeans I'm going to wear, right? When you have that kind of alignment between how you feel, the way you want other people to feel and the way that you're just the personality of you yourself or your company align with the way that you look, there's magic, right? Like it's not just about taking what's trendy or what's cool, but actually having a belief and something that you feel inspired by on the surface is a reflection of what's going on the inside. It's just like, you know, the first thing, like, true beauty radiates from what's going on internally, not just what's presented on the surface. And that's why people get upset when there is that disconnect and disjointedness between how somebody acts and how they actually are versus what they look like. Yeah. Which... I mean, to, to, we'll move off of this point, but also like whenever you're working or treating someone, are you treating them based on the surface level or who they actually want to be or become? And I think that's uh, an interpersonal connection type deal that we can probably tangent off at a later time. But I want to ask you the question in your experience, and this is more, again, on the business front, because huh? the personal front, it's more psychology, but on the business front, have you worked or experienced founders who, because already as an entrepreneur, you're fighting the quote unquote imposter syndrome like mm. it's just natural you're fighting that but on top of that you're also you, there might be incongruency between the brand and the company they're building and the founder have you found like a maybe it's like a tethered soul right mm. like a founder who is like oh like they're not attached like there's some sort of like angst or gap between the company that they have and it might be producing good work mm -hmm. but then them themselves and how they show up in the world like how do you balance that tension or, or have you experienced that tension with founders Yes. And I call it putting on a mask. Like hmm. most people feel like they have to have this kind of persona, either based on industry or the position that they're in. Like, like I'm the CEO of a international software company and I need to, I need to put myself so shoulder to shoulder with this very professional, traditional corporate rote persona, despite the fact that is not at all who they are or who they want to be. And they're trapped. It's like they, they feel like they can't or that there is no other way for them to present themselves visually until they take a look at some of the things that are actually inspiring to them and mm. take those muses and put them into their brand. It helps them come more alive and actually feel like they are connected personally. And there's this amount of confidence that comes with that as well. Because like, I actually believe and this stuff makes me feel good. And it makes me feel the way that I want other people to feel. So I'm going to use this instead me, of doing what I want, what, what the market thinks I should do. Oh, absolutely. 
Absolutely. Tell me, you define, can you define muse? Because you use that a lot. Like, what do you, when you say muse, and I know the dictionary definite, but when you say muse, what does that actually mean? How does that show up in our life? I think it's the things that make you feel, that make you feel the way you want other people to feel. Like, mm. it, it comes so it's from- So it's not selfish. So it's not selfish, though. It's like, how do I want Zach to feel on this podcast? How do I want this person or this founder to be on a call that I have with them? Like, it's how I want them to experience that moment together, right? Yeah, it, it is introspective. So like it does require some kind of awareness of the way that you are currently feeling like yeah. and understanding or knowing to, or knowing when you come across those feelings that are good and they're where it's, where it's an aim, right? You're like, this is how I want people to feel. I know I'm not quite there yet. Or like, mm -hmm. we're not hitting the same mark or the same kind of, there's not a lot of uh, symmetry between how this is making me feel, whatever this influences or muse. And I wish that, um, I think the biggest problem is that people don't recognize the ones that are right in front of their face, like every day or that are taken for granted, mm -hmm. you know, like I'm a big, I'm a big movie fan and I love, I will watch the scene. I've watched the empire strikes back probably 50 times throughout my life. Like oh my God. <laughs> I'd be willing, I'd be willing to put it upwards of 20. If you uh -huh. are an Empire Strikes Back fan and you want to compete with Zach, please send in your message. Yeah, okay. good, good luck. <laughs> right. Good luck with that. <laughs> but the reason, okay. what I ask myself, I'm like, well, why do I keep watching that? Like, there, there is something that's drawing to it. Or another good example is like Lord of the Rings, right? Particularly the Fellowship of the Ring. And I'm going down this route because I think it's a better example. And there's that particular scene when Gandalf is fighting this giant, fiery demon monster in the mines of Moria. And he says, like, you shall not pass. You like, you have no option. Like you cannot pass. I am a servant of the secret fire. Like you cannot pass. And he makes it. And it's like kind of the thing that I draw from that is like the inspiration and the muse for me personally is like mm. the fearlessness and the forthright and the mm. no turning back mentality of like, I am here, I am making a stand, I am confident in it, and I am going to win no matter what it takes. And it's that kind of energy that you're looking for, that kind of resonance. And it doesn't have to come from something like a movie. It could come from something like taking a walk on it. Like what inspires favorite, you, right? Yeah. Your favorite hiking trail. Is it a historical figure when like you hear a speech from like a, a well-known political figure or public servant and it gets you fired up and you feel this like a burn in your your midsection right here where it's mm. like this is that's the kind of connection that i'm looking for or when you see something like a work of art and it's like this is the visual essence of how i want other people to feel when they think of me or they think of my brand like i want this have we stopped to wonder uh, if we as a society or like in general, like in business, like we just go, have we ever stopped to also be in awe? Is that, is, do you see that lacking? I see that lacking. And there's, you could point to the biggest distractor of all them, right? Like, you know, we're walking around with really shiny, glowy objects in our pocket all the time. And we don't really stop to smell the roses or smell the tacos that are at the neighborly taco shop that we adore so much. And then I think there's an additive portion of it as well that I think that we've become a little bit too hyper analytical when it yeah. comes to analyzing things that like the do and don't work as far as design is concerned, right? Like mm -hmm. everyone saw Apple's design language flourish and you saw a bunch of copycats and I call it like Apple washing. They Apple wash huh. their aesthetic. And yeah. there's some principles that I think that like, as far as design's concerned that we shouldn't deviate from like good hierarchy, good legibility, good contrast and flow of information and action. But then you get the flavor of stuff that's missing because there's like, no, like minimal, like we want everything to be yeah. like abundant white space, one color and only blue. And it's like, well, why? Like that doesn't feel anything like you. There is a complete disconnect. Yeah, I think it's like it's offloading that kind of cognitive pressure uh, in a way the thing is going to help them, but it ends up being their demise because they don't believe in it. You know, it's a shell. There's no soul to it. Yeah, it's difficult. And uh, I think you've already answered it, but I'm going to ask the question and answer and then I'll have you add on top of it. And yeah, I'm asking the question and answering it on my own podcast, but that begs the question because 
when you're a founder, you're a business owner, you're growing, you can put design and branding off to the side and not care. Like it's legit. I've, plenty of successful businesses have crap design and crap brands. Like I get it. The reason, in my opinion, the question would be like, why should they care? Most of it, in my opinion, comes back to being in alignment with who you are and showing up either for a job or showing up for like a mission. And I think the distinguishment is being a mercenary versus a missionary, right? Mm. You're just there to get the business, get the cash, get in, get out. I get it. You're completely fine. There's really successful businesses that do that, but they have, like you mentioned, no soul. This would be to have more alignment with what you're doing every single freaking day of your life or the next 10 years, the next three years for a purpose and at least enjoy the ride. And that's my personal thesis. And one of the things that I promote, like promote a lot on this podcast, promote a lot when I work with teams is the journey matters significantly. Your journey matters because you don't know if that next tomorrow is really coming, but also like, what's the point of doing all this? If it sucks, just so that 10 years from now, you're, you've you lost 10 years of your life, but you're now where you quote unquote want to be, but the 10 years sucks to get there. And usually the journey determines the destination. Yeah. Well, why skip out on that 10 years, you know, yeah. especially because there's so many elements that are outside of your control. Yeah. And I would harken back to the point of like, well, you don't have a choice. Like whether you want to build a brand or not, you do not have a choice. So mm -hmm. you can leave this up. You can leave this up to market, uh, market happenings and so to do it anyways, pretty much. Yeah. And it's like why we avoid beauty at, to our spiritual and economic peril to quote Jordan Peterson, like, why would you want to sacrifice a good experience that design adds a lot more value that it takes away even monetarily really quick. Mm -hmm. And it's, it, it, just make, it, it makes you wonder why, like, what is the, is, I, and I think it's because they're scared. Like they don't know how to go about doing this or they're like, I don't want to get it wrong or I don't want, I need it to be perfect. It's never going to be perfect. <laughs> what's that? It's never going to be perfect. No, it's never going to be perfect, but it can damn sure be good. Like, I like and I would say that's a guarantee. Like do, and, and that's a crucial part in, in my process. It's like, I show people that ugly all the time. Like, yeah. You know, I'm, look at these 50 sketches of what your logo could look like. They look like shit. I did them on my <laughs> iPad with like a, with the Photoshop pencil app. They're not perfect. They're not great. Uh, they're not vectored or anything like that, but the concepts have some legs to them. Mm -hmm. And I want founders to believe that they can at least do good, something good with their brand. But it ain't going to be perfect, but you it can will at least, uh, yeah. Yeah. If you're going to do it anyways, at least do your best at it. And it's going to be better than it was. I anyway. that's a really good thesis. How do you, and this is a, so, so we all know, like we had coffee maybe the other week, we were at a coffee shop sitting down and had the avatar drink. The avatar drink is what milk tea matcha. It was like the most amazing thing. You got to try it with it's cinnamon. Delicious. It's incredible, but that's, I would have never ordered that. So thank you for that. You're but welcome. we were talking and you shared with me the concept of being a thief and we'll dive into what that concept is, but. How do you align being in integrity with who the founder, the person, who you are in alignment to how you want to show up, but then also attaching that to being a thief? Tell us a little about that. Well, because you are a makeup, like there's a business consultant, Jonathan Stark, who I know you are also a fan of, yeah. who wrote, he wrote this email recently and it was like, you have no original thought. And it, his reasoning for it was, it was yeah, it is. I always reject the premise, but I'll go along with it. Yeah. But the reasoning behind it is because, well, your thoughts, like there's always some kind of influence, like your out, your inputs end up becoming your outputs yep. in some way, shape or form. Like they get intertwined and like, you know, your synapses connect with one another in your brain, but you are a makeup of all your experiences and the things that you've taken in, be it lessons, the, the link, the words that you use, the beliefs that you have. A lot of that comes from external forces that you have then meshed together mm -hmm. in, in your own personal concoction in chemistry that comes out. So my job is like, well, I want to find the core thing. Like, what are the pillars that are making this Raul cocktail inside of you? And how do uh, one of them being espresso, macchiato, a good sip yep, of coffee. Definitely sipping that. Yep. Yeah. And what are those pillars? How do we define them? How do we turn them from something that's super abstract and unknown and actually pull it out 
and then steal from it. And by steal, I'm, I specifically talk about it in the context of visuals because mm -hmm. people come to me to solve visual problems yep. and experiential problems. And the entire design world is stolen stuff. Like it's typefaces, it's colors that you didn't make up, but are out there and that you are going to pull from or seeing like a typeface. Like I just, I highlighted a typeface on my LinkedIn feed recently that was inspired from redacted CAA documents and like hmm. you know, this work in progress. So they took that and stole from this, these haphazard scans that happened with CIA information and then made the typeface out of it. And it was really cool, but that's stolen. They didn't come up with that. Like they, yeah. there's a really good video that I watched recently called everything is a remix by Kirby Ferguson. Yeah. And it's all about how it, he goes down primarily pop culture, like music and movies and talks about how like, there's only seven story arcs, uh, a lot, like I said, there's something so ridiculous number, like 95% of the movies released in the past 10 years were either sequels or uh, reboots of like a book or mm -hmm. add-ons and same thing with music. It's like, you know, sampling your beats and your instrumentation or like, you know, Eddie Van Halen, even stealing like, you know, the playing playing methods of piano and applying that to guitar oh, yeah. cool. and repurposing and giving it new context to something that already exists. You got me with Eddie Van Halen. Actually, I designed Productive Profits based on his five oh yeah. five. Frank, Frank what's it, Frankencaster? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But uh I took that inspiration. So I did steal that inspiration for the cover of the book, the original book. The second one would be much cleaner. But it's essentially it's identity. And I love how you frame this. I do want to hit on Jonathan Stark's quote because I, I I want to put my perspective on that. But it's essentially looking at, you're looking at the core elements you're, and you're looking at the end in mind. And I, I love that. You're looking at what are the core elements that are inspiring you? Why are they inspiring you? What, why is that muse important to you? What are the core elements of that? How can we go to the roots of that? And how can we design to steal from that to create something new? And I think that it seems like a logical process and like it, and, and I've seen the work that you've done doing work together to, to see how you pull from that. And it just feels natural. It just feels like, oh, okay, like, yeah, that makes sense. Now, one thing though, that I would just be cautious of saying that you no one has an original thought. I think the only issue that I might have with that, that I do have with that idea is that it's to say that no future thought will ever be new, meaning that we've already learned everything that's possible in the world, which mm. is not true because we just discovered another black hole, like I think <laughs> three months ago, which is incredible. Let's just be real. So I think it's important to know that most of your thoughts, maybe in, we can generalize at that. A lot of your experiences, obviously you have your own experience and that's unique and you can contribute to a new body of knowledge because it's assuming that all the human capacity of body of knowledge is filled and it's completely not true. We're very limited, but also and we're limited in our sensory. Like we can't see the gamma rays. We can't see the sound waves in our way. Would it be all white? Or would it be all dark when we start to see everything, right? We don't know. That's a philosophical question. But the cool part is you also take the elements. You take the elements of the muse, the elements of inspiration, but then you also focus what are humans sensory like to create an experience because you focus mm. on visuals you can't focus on smell or taste because the tools that we have at our disposal at least right now in a i still want to call it a 2d world like on our flat screen television or a flat screen phone or a flat screen monitor it's still flat but it's an experience through those visual sensories and maybe in the future design or branding will also include the smell and perhaps the taste if we ever end up that deep into the metaverse. So I think that it might already actually really. Like, yeah. There's a book that I, I read recently called Primal Brand by Patrick Hamlin. It's really good. And I think that it cuts to it. It takes branding to almost like a religious from like a religious point of view and mm -hmm. how people garner that kind of following that someone like an Apple, someone like a Google, someone like an Adobe, someone like, you know, these huge or Tiffany and co or Lego, like these huge overarching brands that have helped shape culture. And he talks about all the different, like every, no sense it is left off as far as I'm concerned when it comes to branding, because you can <laughs> have it. If Chanel was to put out a perfume that smelled like campfire, it'd be off brand. Right. Like it would not. Yeah. But and for me to be sold, they have to send that magazine with the little tablet that I have to open up 
and smell that perfume, right? Not necessarily. Like, like you, you just put visuals to make the experience that. Well, what if you are, what if you're walking in a mall or a store and yeah. you catch a whiff, right? Like it depends on the sense that you interact with first. I would say this, it, cause the reason branding is able to touch all those different areas, it's like, you know, well, blind people are also affected by brands. It's not just the visuals, you know, they yeah. can still hear. And that's where things like, you know, your messaging, your voice and tone come into play. Mm -hmm. Or you can even think about the way that things sound, right? Like mm -hmm. if Steve Jobs sounded like Kermit the Frog or Elmo <laughs> when he <laughs> talks, like, you know, the audio component would be really different. Or to harp on music, the way that like any Van Halen has a very distinct tone. And yep. if you tried it, like you can't extrapolate Eddie Van Halen from the way that he sounds. It's very unique. Yeah. Or even somebody like John Mayer, who has a very distinct tone in his guitar and you can take it a completely different direction and like when you talk about movies you know the soundtrack for pirates of the caribbean wouldn't work for the soundtrack for the departed by True. martin scorsese yeah and even feeling like when you open a like a an apple product like that box was intentionally designed to feel a very specific way or even the way that like a certain guitar feels in your hand or like this plant, the way that the leaves feel versus this other one, like, you know, a prayer plant is very fuzzy, very light, but then a rubber tree is very smooth and mm. very elegant or like a rose compared to a thorn, you know, all of those, those feelings are very different. And so you can, yeah. you can pick and choose and influence and help point, have all that stuff point in the same direction. And that's what you're really looking for as far as engaging all of the senses. That's true. I guess I was just limiting based on the current interactions with most brands online is just through the screen. But this I think you're also right thinking about, it. well, if we did host a live event, how would that feel? How would that look? How would that be captured? What kind of food would we serve? Because that also has an impact, right? It's crazy, like, right? It's crazy. Taste, mm -hmm. If you serve Taco Bell compared to like actual TJ Street Tacos, you're going to get a different vibe. <laughs> Could I ask you the question, like what's, we talked about like maybe some of the purpose of branding. At the end of the day, it's just to share who we are. It's just to share a story. Would you agree with that? Or is it deeper than that? Well, we can talk, we can talk to twofold. I think that there's business applications for it as well. And that's where a lot of people, I think, get turned on when they're looking to play at that higher level with, within business uh, is when they start really honing another brand and trying to market it more efficiently. But yeah. then there is, but then there's the self-satisfaction component of it as well, which is I can get up in the morning and look at my, look at the way that my company talks about itself, look at the way it, the visuals that coincide with it. And I actually feel good about it compared to waking up, looking at it and going, damn. Cringing every morning. Yeah, I know yeah. that's part of the experience. It's either positive yeah. or negative. Like when should we get started to like, you mentioned we, we do it anyways, we're going to have to do branding, but it, usually a, when you're at a better level in business, what I've seen personally too, and experience, that's when we start really putting an emphasis, like uh, to get started, is there like, here's the 80, 20, just to get started. But once you reach this milestone, start considering these things or is it do it all from the start? Oh yeah. I'm a huge fan of like, unless you have, unless you have like venture capital or a significant amount of money to spend on the branding mm -hmm. for an idea that you know will work. Like if you're bootstrapping, like get your product market fit first, because one, those insights are going to be really efficient and useful in help bringing that story to life. Cause you'll see the transformation that happens within people's lives. Yeah. You are, you're help, you're trying to brand that story with your own spin and flavor. It makes a lot of sense. So it's, it, it is a progress. It is a journey. So you don't have to have a perfect, but at least growing the brand, the company, the value to the marketplace with intention and over time improving. And it's also like, we're not perfect at 13 or 23 or 33. I think we're always growing and yeah. improving at that level. That's, it's really good insights. And I think it's, there's a philosophy of branding, right? The philosophy behind how, how humans work, why, yeah. and how we put that in a vehicle of a uh, business. Well, um, it's like friendship, right? Like you want your company or you as a single entity, like your personal brand, would you want to be friends with them? Like, do you want them to be a part of your life or are they replaceable? Because that matters. 
the whole reason that any that business even, businesses even focus on this is because the purpose of branding is to get better customers at higher prices for longer periods of time. Brand mm-hmm. loyalty, premium pricing, and effective connection with your ideal user group. If you're speaking for SaaS. Mm-hmm. Interesting. So higher price points. But again, I think that's a value. So I would argue that the value of the company itself or the product or service has to be significant enough. It's not just a relationship with the brand, but the value that the product provides for me should be important for me to actually care further. Yes. So there, there is that component, but it, that actually a good, a good question. It's like, am I, and I've had actually emails come in around this. How do I charge more? Why do I charge? How do I charge more? What I do? And I think it, if it does dial back to, well, how are you showing up? Up with uh, like sandals. I'm not to say that sandals are bad. You know, successful people with sandals all the time. Even yours truly. But like, how are you showing up? Maybe everyone else is using business casual clothes and you're showing up with sandals and maybe like tattered pants. So it's, how are you showing up? And are you demanding of the marketplace based on the value that you see yourself in and also present yourself in that way? You know, I've been thinking about that too, because it's, it's weird. Like the way that specifically bringing like a founder's personal dress into the mix. Yeah. And I don't, what I think the core thing is it really is just alignment and making sure that it feel that everything feels consistent. If you have kind of a janky, like if you have a janky looking website where there's like mismatched typography, there's not a whole lot of hierarchy within your information. The, the icons look like they were pulled from six different packs that you got on like the noun project or something like that. And then your founder is wearing like Balenciaga shoes and a super like well-cut tailored tuxedo, then you're going to think like, what's going on here? Like this doesn't- Yeah, there's lack of trust. It's always okay. back to trust. Exactly. Yes. And it's that alignment that garners that trust. So I think that as long as, like if you were showing up in uh, like board shorts and flip-flops and you get that vibe right from the get-go, like across all touch points, then makes sense. Yeah. You can still charge more like, cause you're basing it more on the value that like you bring to the actual procedure and the business outcomes, but there's not going to be that disconnect or that hesitancy because it's like, well, you put up this front at first and now I'm seeing you and it's totally different. And that's where I think people get lost. Yeah. Cause brand, I think in my opinion, doesn't, it goes beyond visuals and it goes on your onboarding. It goes on who they talk mm-hmm. to. It goes on how they talk. It goes in the confidence. It goes in, am I getting the services, the high touch points that I paid for or the SaaS or the turnkey like solutions? So I think branding is a holistic experience. And I think it's how we present and show up the first way physically in the digital world, et cetera is a key component uh, to start there, but it also, it doesn't end there. It doesn't end when you deliver the style pack and like, here you go, there's your deck. It's like, here you go, here's what to do next. Here's how to implement it. Here's how to actually live this out. Yeah, well, it takes a lot of uh, precision and thought, right? Like you're continually gonna be designing. Like when I show up, it's I'm giving them things that are like, uh, I'm giving them the base plate, the foundation, like these are your colors. Here's why, because you're telling this story and this is how it connects with you Mm. the founder. You're going to use this style of icon because it fits in with your brand attribute of simplicity and modernity and cleanliness versus being uh, more antique and rough. So I'm helping just kind of lay the base plate for this is North Star here compared to, well, uh, people like like to get a logo like derived from that as well because it's like what i that's what i was trained to do in school yeah (laughs) and like the my what jiro does for sushi is like what i do for logos it's like my the thing that i'm working on consistently that i'm obsessed with that Mm -hmm. i have a tactical skill that accompanies the strategic side yeah i think going back to that too like branding you have to have your mission your values your core culture built out properly or thought through because that it completely attaches to the brand experience but uh, Hmm. there's much more branding is not again like you defined it it's not just it's not just a logo or a slogan or whatever there's a much more depth and complexity to it but zach for all of our listeners out there what's the best place for people to one thank you for this episode and two learn a little bit more about you i think the best place to go would be my website which has links to all my socials. I'm really only on two. I'm on LinkedIn prolifically, and I'm sometimes on Twitter following what's going on and like the crazy turbulent 
crypto space and <laughs> keeping up with other indie hackers and bootstrappers. Uh, my website is Z, like the first, so if I'm going to go like with police jargon here or military, okay. Zebra, Scott, Tom, Victor, Nancy, Scott, dot design. So Z S T V N S dot design. Cool. We'll put that link in the show notes as well. And Zach, thanks again, man. Thanks, brother. If you found value in today's podcast, please consider sharing this with someone that you believe could also benefit from this episode. You never know, you may be the catalyst that opens them up to a new way of operating their business and experiencing life. As always, it's an honor to be a small part of your journey. This is Raul Hernandez. Do good work.